Hey there folks and welcome back. As you may have noticed, often the hardest part of a triple integral problem isn't actually the integration, it's the setup. So in today's lesson, we're going to focus on exactly this, setting up triple integrals. In each of the examples below, I have a triple integral over some specified solid region E. In each case, we're going to choose a coordinate system to work in, either cylindrical coordinates or spherical coordinates. And once we've picked our system, we're going to set up the bounds and set up the integrand. But we're not actually going to worry about evaluating the integral today. Okay, let's take a look at our examples. They're a little bit more advanced than the examples from our previous lessons. In part A, we're looking at the triple integral of the function z over the solid E that lies inside one sphere and outside another sphere. In part B, we're looking at the triple integral of this function, the square root of x squared plus y squared plus 1, over a solid E that lies above one cone and below another cone. Let's go ahead and jump into part A. In part A, we're integrating over the solid E that lies inside the sphere x squared plus y squared plus z minus 1 squared equals 1, and outside the sphere x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals 1. As usual, we'll start by sketching this solid as it appears in R3, and that should give us an idea of which coordinate system to use and how to set up our bounds. We'll start with the easier equation, the sphere x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals 1. This is our usual unit sphere, the sphere centered at the origin with radius 1. It looks something like this. What about our other sphere? Well, the equation looks almost the same as that of our first sphere, except instead of a z, we now have z minus 1. This means that our new sphere has been shifted along the z-axis. It's centered at the point 0, 0, 1, not at the origin. It still has a radius of 1, however, so it's going to look something like this. The solid E lies inside the blue sphere, but outside the yellow sphere. So you can see that the yellow sphere is going to carve out a chunk of the bottom of the blue sphere. We're not interested in that part of the region, just the stuff that lies above it. So here is where the two spheres intersect. We have to take everything above this bump that lies inside the blue sphere. Okay, now that we've identified our solid, we have to decide on a coordinate system. Well, given that we're working with spheres here, perhaps spherical coordinates would be a good choice. If we want to write our integral in terms of spherical coordinates, we need to be able to describe our solid E in terms of our three spherical coordinate variables, rho, phi, and theta. Let's start with rho. Remember, rho represents the distance from points within our solid to the origin. As we move from the origin through our solid E, notice that we don't actually enter the solid until we move beyond this yellow sphere. All of our points lie beyond this cap. But the points can't go on forever. They're always stopped by the boundary of this blue sphere. So the yellow sphere is going to give us our lower bound on rho, and the blue sphere is going to give us the upper bound on rho. We can obtain these bounds explicitly by converting our equations from Cartesian to spherical coordinates. And we'll start with the simpler equation. In spherical coordinates, the expression x squared plus y squared plus z squared, well, this is exactly rho squared. After all, x squared plus y squared plus z squared is the square of the distance from the point x, y, z to the origin. That's exactly rho squared. So the equation of the yellow sphere can be written as rho squared equals 1, or simply rho equals 1. What about our other sphere? This equation looks a little more complicated, but let's see what happens when we expand this squared term. We can write our equation as x squared plus y squared plus z squared minus 2z plus 1 equals 1. Ah, once again, we're seeing x squared plus y squared plus z squared showing up. That is exactly rho squared. We can also convert our z to spherical coordinates using our conversion formulas from the overview. Remember, z is rho cos phi. By canceling the ones on either side of the equation, we can write this as rho squared equals 2 rho cos phi, or equivalently, rho equals 2 cos phi. And there you go. That's the equation of the blue sphere in spherical coordinates. So rho equals 1 is going to be our lower bound, and rho equals 2 cos phi is going to be our upper bound. On the next slide, we'll figure out the bounds for phi and theta and set up our integral. 
We've just shown that throughout our solid E, rho extends from 1 to 2 cos phi. But what about our other variables? Well, it's not too hard to see that theta, which represents the angle our points make with the positive x-axis, can take on any value between 0 and 2 pi. Right? We're going all the way around the z-axis here. So theta is between 0 and 2 pi. Hmm, what about phi? Remember, phi represents the angle our points make with the positive z-axis. Throughout our solid, we can get angles as low as phi equals 0. We get those from points on the positive z-axis itself. But how large can phi be? Well, if you imagine an arm angling down from the positive z-axis, we can continue to lower that arm until we get to this point here, where the two spheres intersect. At that point, the arm has to stop, or else it leaves the solid E. So by examining the points where the two spheres cross, we can obtain the largest possible value for our angle phi. If the two spheres intersect, it means that rho equals 1 from the yellow sphere and rho equals 2 cos phi from the blue sphere. Therefore, cos phi must be 1 half, and from the unit circle we know that phi must be pi over 3. Ah, so we can obtain phi values between 0 and pi over 3. We're finally ready to set up our integral. In spherical coordinates, we know that theta goes from 0 to 2 pi, phi goes from 0 to pi over 3, rho goes from 1 to 2 cos phi, we convert our integrand z into spherical coordinates as rho cos phi, and finally, we multiply by our Jacobian rho squared sine phi d rho d phi d theta. And there you have it, folks. Let's move on to part b. In our second example, we're looking at a triple integral over the solid E that lies above the cone z equals the square root of x squared plus y squared, and below the cone z equals 8 minus the square root of x squared plus y squared. Just like in our last example, we'll start by sketching this solid. Now folks, this first equation, z equals root x squared plus y squared, is one that we've worked with before. This is the equation of a cone that opens upward from the origin at an angle of pi over 4 from the positive z axis. It looks something like this. Our other cone looks very similar to the first, except some transformations have been applied in the equation. If we ignore that 8 for just a second and focus on the equation z equals minus root x squared plus y squared, we recognize this as the equation we had before, except z has been multiplied by minus 1. All of our positive z values are now negative, so our cone has been reflected over the xy plane. It's now pointing downward. By introducing that constant 8, we're increasing all of our z values by 8 units. So that downward opening cone is going to be shifted upward by 8 units along the z-axis. It's going to look something like this. Our solid E is now this portion here that lies above the yellow cone but below the blue cone. Okay, now that we have a visual of our solid, we're ready to pick a coordinate system. You could try setting up this integral in terms of spherical coordinates like we did before, but in this case I think cylindrical coordinates will be a little more elegant. The reason for this is that I see several instances of the expression x squared plus y squared sprinkled throughout the problem. And in cylindrical coordinates, this simplifies really nicely to r squared. Another reason why cylindrical coordinates might be a good choice is that our z values are nicely bounded between the two surfaces. The yellow cone gives us our lower bound on z, and the blue cone gives us our upper bound on z. Finally, if we take our solid E and we smush it down into the xy plane to examine our values of r and theta, we're going to end up with a really nice region with circular symmetry something that cylindrical coordinates will handle very well. So let's go ahead and set up this integral in terms of cylindrical coordinates. I mentioned that the two cones are going to give us the bounds on z. So let's convert these equations from Cartesian to cylindrical coordinates. Since x squared plus y squared is r squared, the equation of our yellow cone can be written very simply as z equals r. And likewise, the equation of our blue cone can be written as z equals 8 minus r. There you have it, folks, the lower bound on z and the upper bound on z. On the next slide, we'll find the bounds on r and theta and set up the integral. All right, folks, I've cleaned up our solid E by removing all the extra bits, 
and I've rewritten the equations of our cones in terms of cylindrical coordinates. We're now ready to find the bounds on r and theta. To find these bounds, we take our solid E and we project it down into the xy plane. We smush it down flat and examine the 2D region that results. In this case, when we collapse our solid E, I think we're going to see a disk centered at the origin. It's going to be this disk here, the widest part of our solid where the two cones cross. So by examining the intersection of these cones, hopefully we can find the equation of this disk and use that to establish our bounds on r and theta. When the two cones intersect, we have that z equals r from the yellow cone and z equals 8 minus r from the blue cone. Therefore, 2r is equal to 8, so r must be 4. Ah, this is a disk of radius 4 centered at the origin. It looks something like this. We can describe that disk in terms of r and theta by saying that r ranges from 0 to 4, and theta ranges from 0 to 2 pi, right? We're going all the way around. With this in mind, we're now ready to rewrite our integral. In terms of cylindrical coordinates, theta runs from 0 to 2 pi, r runs from 0 to 4, and z runs from r to 8 minus r. To convert our integrand, we're going to notice once again that x squared plus y squared is r squared. So our integrand is the square root of r squared plus 1. We multiply by our Jacobian r dz dr d theta.